During their initial examination of the artifact, researchers identified a pattern of unit circles resembling what is known today as the Flower of Life. Multiple grids of this pattern were apparent, suggesting it might relate to a technology used. There are several candidates for what it might represent. Envisioning this pattern not as a flat image, but as a three-dimensional structure, it reminds the close packing of equal spheres, a process linked to fundamental questions about space organization and energy distribution, including such in living systems. A mathematical principle asserts that this arrangement achieves the densest packing possible in three-dimensional space, embodying the concept of doing more with less in nature. These were researched by Buckminster Fuller, an architect, systems theorist, inventor, and the father of synergetics, an interdisciplinary science that presents a view of the universe as an interconnected dynamic system. Fuller was particularly interested in how nature employs the most efficient ways to structure matter and energy, which led him to the discovery of a shape he called the vector equilibrium, also termed space packer by Robert Temple. This shape is notable for its unique properties. The lines radiating out from its center are equally balanced by the lines around its edges, creating a perfect balance of forces. Fuller discovered that this shape can transform into other regular geometric shapes, showing these shapes as different forms of the same configuration. He explained that these transformations represent different stages in the dynamics of energy. This structure relates to hexagons in higher dimensions and represents both the perfect balance of energy forces and the ability to transform into the well-known platonic solids geometrical shapes recognized for thousands of years. In other words, a geometrical model has been discovered for the transition from motion to rest. While the space packer is significant in Fuller's work for its balance and even force distribution spatial properties, another renowned researcher, Lord Kelvin, focused on efficiently packing volume and minimizing surface areas in his studies. He discovered a kind of three-dimensional hexagon, a structure made of 14-sided figures, or volume packers, that can efficiently fill space with equally sized cells, surpassing the efficiency of other geometric shapes. Now, what's important is that these volume packers are not necessarily flat. He found they must have their faces warped and edges curved to fulfill all the conditions of minimal area. This phenomenon is similar to one observed in the vase design, where surfaces, regardless of their shape or angle, are joined by a small curved surface that bridges their contact point. The result of mutual pressure in a system of volume packers can lead to a variety of configurations, from simple close packing to more complex arrangements like the space packer, depending on the level of compression and movement within the system. This leads to a variety of shapes and symmetries. Some of them start looking somewhat similar to the flower of life pattern. And if this geometry contributed to the artifact's design, it raises intriguing questions about the methods and technology used in its creation. Some plasma structures tend to form shapes similar to these geometric patterns. Interestingly, they are referred to by some researchers as the petals in electron vortex magnetic holes, which coincidentally refers to the flower of life. But the exact nature of these geometric structures is still a mystery. What if we're witnessing the result of some unknown physics here that not only allows control over such geometry, but also enables its translation into physical objects? What if there are types of computers embedded in nature or within the matter itself, and there is a way to access and manipulate this translation process. John Archibald Wheeler, influential theoretical physicist, in his profound concept It From Bit, presented the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at a very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation that fundamentally what we call reality arises from the binary of yes-no questions, 
and the registering of equipment-evoked responses. And in short, that all things physical are information-theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Another prominent theoretical physicist, Uno Capvillium, examines how mathematical constructs such as some superalgebras can model complex transformations in the universe. His idea suggests that systems can undergo changes in their complexity. These changes could involve transitions, like turning from non-living to living matter, and vice versa. He wrote, quote, The theory implies the remarkable fact that the ability to think and perform mathematical operations is a relic fundamental property of matter and fields at all levels of organization, meaning it is impossible to brick out the computers hidden in matter itself. Furthermore, the same dynamic algebra or way of thinking can exist on the basis of an infinite number of different realizations. That is, one can hypothesize that structures of unimaginable diversity can be, in quotes, alive. End of quote. Both John Wheeler's concept, It From Bit, and Uno Capvillium's concept of computers hidden in matter and diverse structures that could be considered alive imply that complex structures and behaviors, including life and consciousness, can emerge from simple informational or computational processes. But where should one begin the search? The foundational grid of the flower of life seen on these artifacts simplifies to two intersecting circles. This symbol, recognized by ancient mystics worldwide, represents the convergence of spiritual and material realms. It's an archetypal life symbol, appearing in religious cults as the mandorla in Christian art and in mysticisms as the vesica piscis circles. Remarkably, this shape also surfaces in modern science, ranging from Venn diagrams in logic and computer science to Velarso circles and the Hopf vibration, an important tool in studying certain aspects of the structure of reality. Sometimes it appears as quantum entanglement symbols and occasionally as the geometries of black holes. The Velarso circles are created when a torus is sliced at a specific angle. Such geometry could directly point to a vessel-making technique that tapped into the toroidal shape's energy dynamics. For instance, certain plasma structures like exotic vacuum objects or their big clustered cousin, ball lightning, exhibit this toroidal geometry, which could also be common in other related phenomena. The torus is central to the Hopf vibration, a crucial structure to which we'll circle back shortly. The Velarso circles are the connecting fibers within this structure. A notable aspect of the Hopf vibration is that every circle is connected through every other, extending beyond its own torus to all tori across space. Here it is the essence of sacred geometry, symbolizing the profound interconnectedness of everything in the universe. It's no coincidence that this configuration was recognized in the sacred geometry of various Eastern and Western cultures long before Villarso and Hopf's discoveries. The Hopf vibration itself holds various implications from the aesthetically pleasing to the foundational aspects of reality. Some scholars believe this structure is crucial to grasping the holographic nature of the universe, intertwining consciousness and matter. In the words of the renowned mathematical physicist and Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose, the hop vibration can be considered as an element of the architecture of our world. Historical accounts reveal that Heinz Hopf in topology and Paul Dirac in quantum physics discovered this structure concurrently and in the same year. In the realm of physics, Dirac's discovery led to the concept known as the Dirac monopole. It took decades for scientists to realize that these different concepts were manifestations of the same fundamental principle. We discussed how magnetic structures akin to Dirac monopoles can be useful in stone softening and transportation techniques in this episode. Modern science has not yet determined the exact point on the scale 
that distinguishes the intentional active behavior of living matter from the seemingly inert and non-living. There's an ongoing debate among scientists regarding at which scale we might identify a fundamental agent, a sort of natural microcomputer that bridges active matter behavior with conscious intent. It's intriguing. If ancient people may have intuitively leveraged special techniques to access and bridge the subtle energies of the vacuum's physics, and create phenomena where quantum effects, which are typically observed at the microscopic level, like in atoms and subatomic particles, become apparent in larger macroscopic systems. In fact, such a phenomenon is known in modern science. In essence, it's about observing the strange and counterintuitive effects of quantum mechanics playing out in the bigger world. What is the maximum size an object can have and still show the surprising effects that are typically seen only in the tiny quantum world? Theoretically, there is no size limit. Anton Zeilinger, a quantum physicist, and his team demonstrated that this is possible for big molecules, much larger than a single atom. His colleagues have been advancing such experiments, eventually increasing sizes to biological molecules. They aim to increase the particle size tenfold every year or two, reaching the scale of viruses and even larger biological entities that are about a millimeter wide. If current size limitations in quantum mechanics are merely engineering hurdles, rather than a fundamental physics issue, we may soon harness quantum effects at unprecedented larger scales. This evolving understanding aligns with views like those of Henry Stapp and other scientists who believe that quantum mechanics is not yet fully understood. He argues that the observer's intention and attention, aspects of the human mind, appear to influence experimental outcomes in ways that are not yet fully explained by current theories. Wheeler expanded this idea, suggesting that quantum observation over time, carried out in an appropriate manner, might lead to the fabrication of form, although he did not provide a detailed analysis. And the question remains, could this have already happened in our past? There's an intriguing part in Mark Kvist's article where he wrote that during their investigation of this ancient granite vessel, they discovered that its measurements align with the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz electromagnetic wave traveling through a vacuum. Now, this might be pure coincidence, or it can suggest that ancient technology might have intersected with the level of physics of vacuum. Could it be possible that ancient civilizations somehow were able to create macroscopic quantum effects, including those akin to computers, from the structure of the vacuum itself by linking its physics to our tangible world? Because in, the, it, in, in this other domain, okay, we call the unseen domain, the, the, the domain of the vacuum, the reference frame that I use for looking at it is, is the frequency domain. No limitations of time or distance. My working hypothesis is that the universe we don't see with our tools, okay, is full of intelligence, some much higher than others. Consciousness continues beyond distance time. The assumption is that the space is already conscious everywhere. And then the second step is to activate this indwelling consciousness sufficiently to raise the gauge symmetry state of the space to this higher level of reality. And once it's at that level of reality, we activate the indwelling consciousness of the space. Due to the convergence of mind and matter, these systems might process information not just as computers that are familiar to us, but akin to living organisms, rendering them somewhat alive and interactive. And this interaction could serve as a means of programming these systems. Brian Josephson, a Nobel laureate, suggests in his paper the idea that nature at some deeper level has biological aspects is not fundamentally absurd and has been previously explored by other scientists, and that the biological logic applicable to such a scenario could lead to what might be termed extended mind. Josephson also notes that the laws manifested in the laboratory are emergent rather than fundamental 
is already a feature of string theory. In computer science, the distinction between hardware and software is not only natural, but also intuitively mirrors the differences between matter and consciousness. If we imagine the minimal nature agency as a primordial microcomputer, the task is to identify a crucial link in nature where the capacity to change the program of matter's behavior emerges. This also alludes to the idea that under appropriate conditions, humans' intent can override information in such a microcomputer, basically tweaking the behavior of matter and the information that it obeys, essentially performing what might be termed as ancient techno magic. It's like hacking the matrix code of reality. Such an info computational approach to the concept of microcomputer embedded in nature has been shaped under the influence of John Wheeler, the renowned theoretical physicist. Wheeler not only coined terms like black holes and wormholes, but also popularized the slogan it from bit that was modified later to it from qubit, suggesting that all physical phenomena at the most fundamental level can be described as pure information. He also suggested that at the most fundamental level of reality, the system operates on a binary response basis, such as yes-no or zero-one logic, basically acting as interconnected cell automata arrays. The microcomputer metaphor helps to understand the operations of such a module that continually transforms matter into information and then reverts information back to matter. This basic unit inherently combines memory storage and information processing capabilities, similar to a CPU. Thus, it functions akin to an electronic circuit element called a parametron, which is a good analogy for the simplest form of agency in nature. A related design feature is two rings connected. Nature often favors versatile solutions, and the parametron analogy aligns well with this principle. It has two stable states that represent 0 and 1, and it can switch between acting as a memory unit and a logic component of a processor. Nature, devoid of electronic circuits, operates its systems across the universe's diverse scales, oscillating between phases of wave order and vortex chaos. This suggests a resemblance to a kind of a natural equivalent of the parametron.